Welcome to Cross City Church at Home and Happy Father's Day. To dads everywhere, we hope that you have a blessed day and that you know how grateful we are for you. If you're a guest with us, we're so glad you're here. Click the link that says guest, watch the message from Pastor John Metter, and let us know that you stopped by. Along with our online services, you can also choose to worship in person at any of our locations. You can get more details about services and how we're keeping each other safe at crosscity.church. Now let's honor dads, worship together, and let God's word shape our lives. Welcome to Cross City Church. I love my dad because he's kind and funny. I love my dad because he helped with my soccer team. Because he's funny and he never gives up. He likes to spend time with us and he does things for us. Um, I love him with all my heart and he does lots of things for us. And he's so nice. He's always there to support me through thick and thin. He's my lifesaver. He gives me plushies when we go on work trips. Yeah. He watches over us. He plays me with me. He plays with me and he lives weight with me. I love my dad because he's always there for me. I love my dad because he loves me. He's a great person to look up to. He's a great cuddle monster. He helps me and he lets me to eat a lot of ice cream. He plays with me and he makes me feel safe. He's so caring, loving, and always there to make me smile. He taught me how to ride a bike. He loves me and makes it work in homeschool. I love my dad because he's funny. He plays football with me and tucks us in. I love my dad because he helps me dinner. He spends time with me and last but not least, he relieves me of having to help Lucas with his homework. I love my dad because he's always there for me. He's, throughout this entire quarantine, he's been like a rock I can lean on and I'm just so grateful that he always brightens my day. I love my dad because he always makes me smile, he always makes me laugh. He also threw me a prom, so that was pretty cool too. I love you, Dad. Love you, Dad. Love you, Dad. Happy Father's Day.
every time I face the waves I don't want to be afraid I don't want to be afraid I don't want to fear the storm Just because I feel gonna be afraid cause those waves are only waves I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna be afraid I'm not gonna fear the storm you are greater than its roar I'm not gonna fear the storm and thanks for joining us. We're all about real people, finding real hope and experiencing real life in Christ. And if you're interested in finding out more about our church and how you can be involved, join us for our Next Steps class. Next Steps will help you take a closer look at who we are and how we can grow together. Find out more and sign up today at crosscity.church slash next step. This week, Neighborhood Kids Craze is coming to a community near you. Monday through Thursday, kids will have a blast together and have a chance to hear how much God loves them. It's set up with safety in mind, with smaller groups meeting in homes and parks, and we hope that your kids will join us. 
Find out more and sign up today at crosscity.church slash kidscraze. Our giving always matters, but through the summer, our gifts are especially important for reaching kids and students. Online giving is easy and every gift helps. We're making big progress on our Generations Project, and today, Pastor will share about what we've done and where we're headed. And then we'll continue looking at the life of Joseph. Even though his life was filled with dilemma, God blessed him for his faithfulness. Remember that you can follow along with the message on the notes tab or at crosscity.church notes. Now let's hear from Pastor John Metter. We're so glad you've joined us again. And uh, as we prepare to get into the book of Genesis chapter 39, uh, in just a few moments, uh, we'll be continuing with our series on the Chronicles of Joseph. And uh, this week, a chapter of dilemma. So turn to Genesis chapter 39. And as you're turning, let me give you an update about what's happening with our buildings and our services. As you may know, we're back in our services and all of our normal times, uh, we are, we're holding services and we're doing well. Uh, it's exciting to see people come back. We want you to come back when you're ready. We're observing social distancing. Every other role is left vacant. And uh, we have plenty of space in between the seats and sanitation uh, is at its all time high. And uh, I'm very thankful for how our staff has worked with that. Uh, but at the same time, we know that there are those that are very cautious, very careful. We're watching the trends just like you are. You come back uh, and physically worship with us when you're ready. And until then, we're going to continue our online content uh, just as we're doing now. So welcome to uh, the service and the message today. I also want to say a word about our, our Generations Project. We are completing Building C. I walked through yesterday and saw all the new carpet that was laid. There's just a few pieces left. The stairways are nearly complete, and there's a full 12 inches of tread there. It's just uh, it's amazing how those have been transformed over these last few months. You'll be looking at a very different building when you do come back. Building C is ready for full occupancy, which makes us also ready for the actual demolition of Building B and the construction that will be taking place later on this summer and fall. So come see uh, as you can and also be involved with us. If you haven't been participating in Generations, now's the time to kick it off. Just come with us and we're looking forward to it and for you to be involved with it as well. In a couple of years down the road, we'll look back and we'll be amazed at how it transforms our entire campus. Well, let's take our Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 39, uh, the Chronicles of Joseph and the chapter of Dilemmas. Uh, we looked at the chapter of Detours last week. The chapter of Dilemmas is this week, and you'll see what I mean as I began to read. Chapter 39, we'll just read the first six verses to start with, and here's what it says. It says, Now, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an official, Egyptian official of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. So the Lord was with Joseph, so that he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant and he made him an overseer over his house and all that he did and owned he put in his charge. It came about that from that time he made him the overseer in his house and over all that he owned the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge and with him there did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. So that's an interesting text that begins our amazing story today about the dilemmas of Joseph. Now the life of Joseph is a story of how God worked on one man to prepare him for the greatest impact in the world at that time. Here's the Cliff Notes version again. Joseph goes from the promise of those dreams to the pit at the hands of his brothers. From the pit to the palace serving Potiphar. We'll look at that today. From the palace to the prison at the end of our story today after being falsely accused. And then from the prison to position as he interprets Pharaoh's dreams and from position to prominence in the end. Just like the fact that there are many detours along the way, there are also many dilemmas on the journey. Crossroads where your allegiance and wisdom will be tested and tried in greater ways than you can possibly imagine. Now, we've just read the text. The setting for this chapter is the movement from the pit that his brothers threw him in to the palace of Potiphar, and then at the end, sadly, to prison. Now, I've worded these dilemmas of Joseph in a way that makes them common to all of us, because they are. Joseph's story 
is a classroom experience for anyone who will learn from him, and I'll be one of those learning from him. So let's begin by looking at two dilemmas. Dilemma number one, we want to control our own destiny, our own future, but God will teach us to trust him instead. Now our text began in verse one saying this, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar bought him. This reminds us that God's sovereign hand is on Joseph even when his brothers betrayed him and sold him into slavery. I, I think this is the worst possible, imaginable situation for him personally. And it places him, on the other hand, in the best possible geographical location in the world for the famine that, known only to God, was about to unfold. Notice that Joseph is not in control. Notice he's still very young and unable to get out of this dilemma. And notice that God is still in control and placing him exactly where he needs to be if you read the rest of the story. He's in Potiphar's house. This is like landing in an amazing palace after being in a filthy pit for so long. So he's in this unbelievable place looking around at all the things that, that could strike him as very, very attractive from the pit to the palace. Now the pit was not his destination, though he may have wondered about it while there. But Joseph is not distracted by the opulent splendor that he's in the middle of. He's not distracted by the rich food and the beautiful and the powerful Egyptian people. His life is dominated, absolutely fixated on the fact that God is with him. I know this because in the chapter where we read the Lord was with Joseph, we see it four times. You see it in verse 2, then again you see it in verse 3, in verse 21, and finally in verse 23. So the God who was with him in the pit is with him in the palace. And the God who was later going to be with him in prison is there very present with him. So it really doesn't matter where he is, but what really matters is who he is with. And he's with the Lord. Now, while the presence of the Lord in his life had a pacifying effect, it also had a very, very powerful effect on Joseph. Everything good that happened to him in Potiphar's house was the result of the presence of the Lord. So let's watch this presence elevate Joseph, rapidly raise, raising him from an unpredictable place uh, in the pit to an incredible place of influence and prominence. In just a few remarkable years, we read how this unfolds. And we see this in several verses in the text. For example, in verse 2, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. The wording here is unmistakable. Joseph's success was because of God. Then look in verse 3. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him. We have to remember the context here. Potiphar was a godless Egyptian, not a Yahweh worshiper. He didn't know the Lord. And yet he saw God working in Joseph's life. We realized that God was with him. Then look at verse 3. It says, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper. There was just no other explanation. Potiphar was probably thinking, how did I stumble on such a talented guy? How did I find such a faithful man? I must be an incredible judge of character. But he had actually no idea that God actually had placed him there. Now look in verse 4. So Joseph found favor and became his personal servant. Are you watching the promotions with me? This whole process has unfolded in over nine years He's growing in influence, and now he's the personal servant and confidant of Potiphar. And then the scripture says this, and he made him overseer over his house. That's verse 4. This is the highest place he can be in the house, overseer, from the pit to the palace because of the presence of the Lord. I know that sounds corny, but that's exactly what's happening. And surely Joseph knows this, and he's grateful. And then again, the next verse, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. That's in verse 5. Joseph is a blessing to everyone around him. What a convicting lie. I read the life of Joseph and ask questions like, am I a blessing to people around me the way Joseph is a blessing to everyone around him? And then finally in verse 6 it says, so he, that is Potiphar, left everything he owned in Joseph's charge. This is the natural result of faithfulness and integrity and its trust trust. The more trustworthy Joseph became, the more he was given to oversee. 
Listen to me very carefully. This is how leadership works. It's not a matter of being given a position. Joseph had no position. It was about trust. Here's a quote for you. True leaders can be entrusted with responsibility regardless of their title. I know a leader when I see someone that's faithful, not when I see someone with a title. So what does the presence of the Lord actually do in Joseph's life or in our lives that results in so many good things? The presence of the Lord is a practical daily awareness that God can and will guide every word, every decision, and every relationship in our lives so that we're a blessing to God and to every person around us. It's the willingness to trust his wisdom, not our wisdom, to listen to him and not to our own natural tendencies and biases. It's how Joseph was living, to go with God and not to go with our gut. The scripture makes it clear it's not education, it's not sterling personality, it's not real life experience or intuition, it's the presence of the Lord, it's undeniable. So all this makes me ask hard questions, and here they are. Am I a blessing to people all around me? Am I seen as faithful and able in all ways? Do people see the presence and favor of the Lord in my life? Ask yourself those questions. You might say this, are we really gonna bless everyone? I mean, can you really go through life and bless everyone? I know it's unthinkable in today's world, but Joseph's nation, Israel, was the nation God was talking about when he said to Abraham, through your offspring, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Later in the book of Proverbs, we read this. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Proverbs 16, 7, it's a great verse to remember. Big question. How did Joseph have this quality? Joseph is standing out as an unusual man in scripture because of the presence of the Lord. Now history has been brief up to this point. After all, we're in the very first book of the Bible and we're in the era of early civilization. But one thing is very clear. God created man and desired man to walk with him from the beginning. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening in the garden. Enoch walked with God and the scripture says he was not because God took him. It was a fellowship thing. Noah walked with God and built an ark. It's clear that God man, made man capable of walking with him. It's also very clear that God gave man a choice to walk with him or not. The ark that Noah built was to destroy a world that was just a few generations removed from Adam and yet was wicked and godless already. There's a choice. We read all that in Genesis chapter 6. So some choose to walk with God and some choose to walk on their own understanding and there's a big difference between the two. So what about Joseph? How does he stand out from his brother? Same family, same father, different life. How does he know God's presence? This is where the study for me gets very interesting. Joseph grows up with these 12 brothers and none of the other 11 seem to walk with God at all. As a matter of fact, they're wicked. Joseph's mother died when he was young, so there's no indication that she had a great deal to do with this. But when you get to Joseph's father, Jacob, there you have something interesting. In my study, I came to the conclusion that Joseph knew God's presence because his father, Jacob, walked with a limp. Now that may need some explanation. Jacob's life, Joseph's father, is a mixed bag. He's not a perfect man. In childbirth to Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob is one of the twins that the Lord called two nations in Rebekah's womb. Esau came out first and Jacob came out holding his heel. His name means supplanter and it's appropriate. Jacob eventually took his brother's birthright and later on stole Esau's blessing from his aging father. Still later, Jacob journeys to find a wife and he has an amazing experience. He has this dream of a ladder ascending to heaven and he has an encounter with God. And he says there at that point, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. Genesis 28, 20. Do you see that? Did you catch that? If God will be with me, he is asking for God's presence. Jacob is. He wants God to be with him. Jacob is favored by God, works successfully for Laban, acquires wife, and then returns home when the Lord tells him to, along with the promise from God, and I will be with you. Those are connected. That's in Genesis 31. And on the way home, angels meet him and reassure him because he fears what will happen when he meets Esau his angry brother, and Jacob wrestles all night long with a man that we all know is an angel from the Lord outside the camp at night and refuses to let go until the angel blesses him. Out of this highly unusual experience, Jacob gets up and walks 
with a limp for the rest of his life, but the testimony is this. I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. In the end, Jacob is a man of faith who walked with a limp because of the presence of God in his life, and everyone knows this. They know his lamp, and they know his faith. He is so highly favored of God that he becomes part of the verbal Mount Rushmore of the Bible. When Israel refers to God, it often refers to him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jacob's in that ring of honor because he walked with God and was, like the other two, a recipient of God's covenant promise for Israel. This gives hope to all fathers everywhere that imperfect men who learn to have faith in God and may walk with the lamp can pass on to their children the possibility that men can walk with God. Not all will hear it. Not all will want it. I mean, after all, God gives us a choice. Fathers cannot control the response or the result. But Joseph saw his father's lamp, heard his story, and believed and knew the presence of God. God's presence is not automatically trans transmitted to the next generation, but it's observable by our children and grandchildren. And when they see it, they will know it's real. And that counts for everything. Your authentic faith, fathers, mothers, can be the inspiration for the spiritual hunger of those who see and observe how real it is. Fathers, this is so important on Father's Day to be looking at the influence of a father. So here's a question. How have you seen faith lived out in a parent's life? And what kind of faith are you passing on to the next generation? That's dilemma one. I want to be in control, but God's going to teach me to trust. Dilemma number two, you must constantly choose what you love the most, the pleasure of sin or the presence of God. So this is a pretty big deal as well. And it's an amazing thing that unfolds here. It's the dilemma of lust, temptation, and rejection. This is the part of Joseph's life that gets a lot of attention. All the ingredients for a massive, horrific fall into sin are present. So we're going to read the account in its entirety, beginning in chapter 39, the latter part of verse 6, all the way through verse 20. So as you pick your Bibles up again, we'll go through that very section. The last part of verse 6 uh, says this. It kind of starts the story off. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And by the way, that statement has nothing to do with how God was with him and God was present with him. But rather, it is a commentary that helps us understand what's going to unfold. He's about 28 years old at this point. The scripture says he's handsome in form and appearance. It means he's a good-looking guy. It means he's well-built. It means he's probably a temptation to those around. Verse 7, it came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he's put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household were there inside. And she caught him in his garment, by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. And when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. She's telling a, a clear lie there, an accusation that's false. Verse 16. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home, and then she spoke to him with these words. The Hebrew slave which you brought to us came in to me and made sport of me, and as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. Well, this is a pretty negative turn of events, isn't it? But this is exactly what's unfolding here. Voting here. Now, get into the story with me. The temptation here is powerful. Potiphar's wife is no doubt beautiful and very much attracted to Joseph. 
She's bold in her proposition. She's repeatedly trying to wear down his objections. She's calculated in her approach. And finally, one day, she catches him alone in the house and makes her most daring move. This scenario gets closer and closer to the fire of desire and immorality. And many have given in to this kind of temptation, but not Joseph. But let's look and see why. Look at his character. In verse 8, <clears throat> the scripture tells us he responded immediately, but he refused. Immediately, his response was no. Everything we know about human nature tells us this is a tough temptation to turn down, but what we know about Joseph tells us why he says no. This young man is acutely aware of the presence of God in his life. He knew it was God who rescued him, placed him, blessed him, and gave his life purpose and meaning. Joseph was going to do nothing to compromise that. God was with him, and Joseph was not going to walk away from God in the moment of great temptation. The awareness of God's presence in your life and your desire to keep him there is the strongest deterrent to sin. It should be the one constant in your life, God's presence. So look at this conversation with me now. This conversation is not going to be about the possibility of pleasure the way people talk about pleasure now. He's not gonna talk about his needs or his desires or his feelings. He's not going to say anything about her beauty or how well they get along. He's not going to entertain how they can get away with the sexual encounter she's asking for. He's not gonna wonder why something that could feel so good is sin in God's eyes or why God created the sexual desire if it was gonna be forbidden. He's not going to be unclear either about his stance. Instead of all that, look at what he does say. He says, there is no one greater in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife, verse 9. This is not a boast about position. It is a statement of responsibility. He's saying, my master, trust me. I have a responsibility to be faithful to him. It's not about what I want. It's about what he asked me to do. When I read this, I realize Joseph's response is so noble, so filled with integrity, no wonder Potiphar has trusted him with everything. Everything Joseph said has to do with doing the right thing. When others entice us to do wrong, we must take a stand to do the right thing. James says in the book of James, to him who knows the right thing to do and does it not, it's sin. But Joseph also has something to say to her. He says in verse 9, you are his wife. First he talks about his responsibility and now he reminds her of her responsibility. You're his wife. You don't belong to me. You belong to him. This is not going to be the popular thing to say. She's not going to be happy, but it's the right thing to do. Now, there's a reason I point this out, and here's what it is. Playing with sexual temptation and having sexual activity outside of marriage is wrong in every instance. The Bible is crystal clear on this, and this truth should be part of your conviction and your conversation. When temptation is present and flirtation is happening, Joseph's conviction and conversation should be yours. Marriage is a covenant relationship between man and a woman. That's the deepest and most important human relationship on the planet. It is never worth it to compromise something so divine and so ordained by the Lord as marriage. His conversation made that clear as yours should. Finally, look at his calling. Here's what Joseph said that stands out more than anything. Verse 9, how then could I do this great evil and sin against God? This statement slams the door shut to temptation. The God of my fathers, the God who was with me in the pit, who gives me favor in this household and who will be with me in the future, is with us here at this moment and I will not let him down. Joseph is saying, I know who I belong to, who I answer to, who has plans for my life. I know the Lord is with me and I love his presence more than the pleasure of sin. Joseph knew that sexual sin could derail all the plans God had for him, and he was not willing to compromise his calling. He knew what was at stake. He knew he would lose an amazing opportunity to serve the God of the universe if he gave in to sin. The opportunity to sin can ruin the opportunity to serve God, and it happens far too frequently. Joseph refuses repeatedly, and on the day she catches him alone, he leaves his garment behind and flees. He's living out the admonition we find in the New Testament. Flee immorality. You read that in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. So let's recap so that when temptation comes, you can be ready. Remember your character. 
As a believer, you should cherish God's presence in your life above all else. Remember your conversation. Be ready with the best possible answer. No. Talk about responsibility, not opportunity. Let others know your allegiance to your marriage, your responsibility. Then remember your calling. This is not just about you and someone else. It's about you and God and his plan for your life. Nothing, nothing is more valuable. So Joseph does the right thing, but things don't go smoothly after that. In fact, it actually goes downhill from there. He flees, she screams, she accuses, Potiphar is angry, and Joseph is sent to prison. From the pit to the palace to the prison. There are times, if we stop reading too soon, where we ask the really tough questions and we struggle with the answers. Questions like, does it pay to serve God when it just doesn't seem to work out? Or is it worth it to serve God and do right even when it goes unrewarded? Look at Joseph. He is so faithful, but it goes unrewarded for the moment. He's out of the pit, but now back in the prison, falsely accused with no one to speak for him. In the book of Job, Satan asked God a piercing question about Job. He said, God, you've blessed him so much, but will a man serve God for nothing? Will a man worship and fear God for nothing? Doesn't he just serve you to get reward? Would he serve you if everything turned bad? The story of Job is the answer to that question, and the resounding answer is yes, a man will serve God for nothing. Yes, we will serve God just to have his presence, just to know it's the right thing to do, just because he's God. So I say to you, if you're asking these questions, just keep reading the story. Just keep living for God. One day, you'll look back and you'll say it will be worth it all. Job would say that. Joseph would say that. Live for God just because he is God. Now, as we conclude this, I'm going to ask a question that's very important. How do we get the presence of God in our lives? If the Lord was with Joseph, if that was such a big deal in his life, if it helped him weather all the temptations, how do we get that? And the reality is we get it because of the good news, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon men. But in the New Testament, once we put our faith and trust in Christ, he comes to live within men. That every man and every woman who puts their faith and trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior has the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life from the day that they accept Christ until the day he comes for them. The Holy Spirit will never leave us. It's possible to grieve him. It's possible to quench him, but he'll never leave us. Once I put my faith in Christ, God has been with me from that moment forward. He is with me. And the closer I walk with him, the more evident that is. And the same is true of your life. But it all begins when we put our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. Have you done that before? Have you ever come to the place where you realize you need his presence and you need his power so badly that you gave up on everything you've done in order to please God? And you just said, Lord, I can't do this. I can't change the past, the past of my life. I can't handle the, the present things in my life. I need you to forgive me of sin. I need you to give me the gift of eternal life. I need you. If you're at that place today, I will tell you that God is standing ready to answer your requests for his presence. He won't make you do it. But like Joseph, if you want his presence, you can have his presence through his son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray a brief prayer. And this prayer is the kind of prayer you would pray if you want to put your faith and trust in Christ. So as we bow together, I'll pray a phrase at a time. Join me in this prayer, and then we'll help you with next steps. Let's bow together. Father, hear our prayer today as we ask you for your presence. Lord, today I know that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin. Today I realize I need your forgiveness and your presence. So I ask you today to forgive me of my sin and give me the gift of eternal life. I turn away from my sin and all that I've trusted in the past. And I put my complete faith and complete confidence in you. I ask you to be my savior and I ask you to be my Lord. And Lord, I ask you to be with me. I choose to follow you like Joseph. Father, thank you for the promise and for fulfilling that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So today, if you'd like to click the link beneath me on the screen, you'll have help for next steps. 
We'd love to talk with you about your decision today and help you know how to walk with the Lord on a daily basis, just like Joseph did. Thank you so much for joining us. How do you deal with the dilemma in your life? Joseph gives a great example of the importance of character and how we can stay strong through anything that we face. Take a second and consider the questions that we'll put on the screen in a moment. And let God continue to build your character so you can stand with confidence through any circumstance or temptation. We hope you have a great week and that we see you again next week online or in person at Cross City Church.